I think in the last five years, there's been, uh, for most of us, we've seen this unprecedented decline in Western governments and the demise of law and order in many places. And we've seen leaders grasping for totalitarianism and Marxist ideas and Marxist philosophies. And in fact, no Christian family is really exempt from the social engineering and the pagan policies that are coming out of governments these days and all the anti-Christian rhetoric that I'm sure you've seen a massive increase in the last five years. But back in 44 AD, it was not that different. Uh, in fact, it was even worse. James lives in a corrupt world of Roman totalitarian dominance, immorality, corruption, false teachers, and the small fledgling Christian church is experiencing massive Jewish persecution. And James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. He is the most significant leader at this time. And he writes 108 verses to his scattered and fearful flock. And he calls this new uh, Jewish Christian church the 12 dispersed tribes in verse 1 of James 1. And so James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he was obviously infinitely qualified to write this letter. At this point, he writes probably as, as uh, this is the first letter you probably have in your, your scripture, your New Testament. And he writes over 60 imperatives on these pages, exhorting his scattered flock to live differently in the sea of paganism and misplaced religious fervor and persecution and so the emphasis for for James here is not so much for his Jewish listeners to become Christians uh, but rather it's an exhortation for diverse people to be behaving like Christians in a new body called the church trials are inevitable but how were they to live through these trials that is the question and so James covers several topics here in this short letter of 108 verses, and it's uh, totally relevant for us here today in Johannesburg, in South Africa, and it meets you where you are exactly at. He talks about praying and checking our motives in prayer, and he talks about not sinning. He talks about watching out for favoritism, being doers of the word, guarding our speech, being submissive to the Lord, be wary of the motives concerning riches, working on relationships and heeding correctives about healing. And James calls uh, his flock brethren, and this is a term of endearment used over 15 times, and so he identifies with his fellow believers in their painful trials. And if you really want to know the crux of this letter, it really is in chapter 3, verse 8. You could summarize it as visible, wise faith. Visible, wise faith. Nowhere does James say that they ought to claim themselves out of hardship to health and wealth and prosperity. In fact, James does not even pray that God extract them from the trials that they're in. James wants them to live through the hardships with practical godly wisdom, wisdom from above not pagan, earthly wisdom of the world around them. And so perhaps the title for the sermon tonight is A Divine Perspective on Suffering. A Divine Perspective on Suffering. And so what we have here then are four divine perspectives to be grasped by suffering believers so that you will live and end your Christian lives well. The first divine perspective is going to be on God's purpose, and that will be verses 2 to 4, and that's the bulk of our time this evening. And then there's a divine perspective on prayer in verse 5, a divine perspective on doubt in verses 6 to 8, and a divine perspective on social status in verses 9 to 11, before James concludes in verse 12, wrapping this whole section up. Firstly, let's talk about the divine perspective on purpose, and we'll look at the text here, verses 1 to 4 tonight. Let's read it. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, 
greetings. Verse 2, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's just stop there for a moment and think about what he writes here. In the church our size at Antioch Bible Church, there's always going to be a mother or father who has lost a child. There will be a son or daughter who's lost a parent. Someone who is dying from disease or at least recovering from a serious operation. And yet there's hardly a counselor or a counseling class that would teach Go up to those that are hurting, and the first thing that must come out of your mouth is, my dear brother or sister, consider it all joy. And yet James does this in the second verse. In fact, in our easily offended world today, uh, this would be seen as rather insensitive, quite callous actually, and very offensive. And I, you know, I tend to concur with that if that's the first thing you say. Perhaps you say that on the second day. But if you were raised believing that the Christian life ought to be free of pain, free of, of all kinds of trials, free of problems, then this passage will definitely not make much sense to you. Great groups of professing believers are told that it is their best life now. More spiritual Christians are supposedly blessed through a lack of trials and health and riches. That's what we are told today. And that struggling Christians are of a lesser spiritual order. And they must be sinful because they experience trials. And friends of the great sufferer Job held exactly this view. And they were totally wrong. When James in the text here says the word, he says consider in his typical shorthand, he's actually commanding you and I to make a thoughtful biblical judgment about painful trials not an emotional one. Consider means reckon or count it, brethren. James is saying, make a definite decision about the trials that you will encounter. In this Greek construction, actually James front loads this entire verse and he says, all joy regard your trial. And if you knew James and his life uh, and you've read the rest of this letter, you would know that James is not being insensitive and that he does not mean some kind of masochistic, mindless sort of happiness that revels in the agony of pain. Not at all. James is referring to a reasonable, scripture-informed, thought-led, and settled eschatological joy or contentment in this passage. This joy is based on knowledge, Knowledge of a good God's providential design and purpose. And notice verse 2. And James says, when you encounter various trials. He doesn't say, if you're going to encounter various trials. But when you encounter various trials. And so the biblical view then is that God's, in God's purposes, trials are not simply an unusual, remote, or surprising possibility for believers. They will happen. The word encounter here is the same word used in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, if you remember that, when a man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he encountered or he fell among the bandits. And in that day he was accosted by the robbers and it's portrayed as if it was a regular event, but it happened suddenly without warning. That's the idea of when you encounter various trials. And so when in verse 2 means that trials are part of living as sinners among sinners in a fallen and broken world. This is about the realistic Christian life. Coming to Christ does not mean trials are removed and it does not mean that trials will even be reduced. Notice also James in verse 2 says that when you encounter various trials... And James is referring to the many and multicolored, is that what that word means? Diverse kinds of trials that you will fall into, you will encounter. And so how do we understand the word trials here? Because actually in the Greek, the word has two meanings. It can mean external trial 
or it can mean an internal temptation. And James uses it in both senses in his letter. But here, the near context helps us understand that what it means here. In verse 2, the word trials is followed by the phrase, look in your text, the testing of your faith in verse 3. And so this is referring to the testing of man by God. And so this mostly refers to external conditions brought upon by God's direct command or God's providence. In Genesis 22 verse 1 it says that when God asked Abraham to take his beloved son, can you imagine that, Isaac, and sacrifice him, it says that God was testing, same word, Abraham, the same word used in the Greek translation, the Septuagint, as used in James here. Likewise, when all those difficult plagues which hit Egypt, Scripture says that Pharaoh was tested by God in Deuteronomy 4, 7, and 29. And so here in chapter 1, James is not limiting trials, but he includes all kinds of external trials, broad enough to include trials from living in a fallen world that is under judgment and that will indeed test your faith. The death of a loved one, health issues, sickness, terminal illnesses, financial hardship, homelessness, poverty, the dangers of riches, broken relationships, hurtful words, and even favoritism. And now this is important in verse 3. James says, knowing, note that there, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And so when you put this together, James is giving us here really the right foundation for the right attitude through all the trials that you as believers will indeed encounter. There's this deep-seated contentment and joy through a trial, and it is possible because it's based on ongoing knowledge, unique knowledge that a believer has. And that ongoing knowledge is that no matter what painful trial comes our way, it is there because God has a good purpose. And that purpose is that God is testing my faith. And that word testing there is not the word that means trip me up or anything like that, like you're going to go write a test or an exam. We're in exam season now. It is testing in such a way that God is going to produce endurance. And so testing here in verse 3 is a word used really when you try and prove a precious metal. And it even incorporates the process involved. And say, so what do you mean by that? For example, to be certain of the purity of a yellow rock called gold, the rock is placed in a crucible and is heated to 1100 degrees Celsius. Periodically, that crucible is removed from the, the blazing furnace and the dross or the impurities can be seen as they float to the surface of that molten 1100 degree metal. And then that dross can easily be skimmed off from the surface of that molten gold. And so the gold in the crucible then is stirred and it is again placed back on the furnace. And the more often you repeat this process, the more you can remove the dross and the more valuable the gold. And so finally you produce glittering 24 karat gold which is soft and pliable and it's useful in the hands of a metalsmith and it is of great value. So do you get the idea of what God says when he's testing your faith? He is producing spiritually in your life. He is using trials, the furnace of trials and difficulties to test, to prove your faith. And this is the usual way God works in the lives of Christians. And if you're not sure about that, you just go back to the Old Testament in Isaiah 48 verses 10 to 11. God says this regarding his chosen beloved people. He says, behold, I have refined you metalwork language. I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? Again, God says in Proverbs 17, verse 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests, same word, 
the Lord tests the hearts. In other words, like the refining process for silver and gold, God makes sound hearts in his people. And so God will use trials in the life of every Christian to test and refine out and to reveal the spiritual dross for it to be removed. And that is a repeated process. And it increases your capacity to endure. Look at verse 7. The testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance. And that means steadfast perseverance. Steadfast perseverance as Christians. I think Tim read 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning. And Peter writes to believers caught in fiery trials uh, at the time. And he refers this to uh, this exact process as well. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 to 7. He says this. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof, same word, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And note then here in verse 7, Peter sees that painful trials in the lives of believers have an eschatological end times perseverance. When is it going to be revealed? Peter says it will be revealed, it will be seen at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, distressing trials refine your faith better than the process of refining gold because gold is perishable. So that you endure to the end when your true straight status as a Christian is revealed in your praise and glory at the return of Christ. And this has eternal value and it is not perishable. So we all pray as we sing often in this church and we pray, we say, come Lord Jesus, come, come. And it is a purifying hope. It is a blessed hope to live in that imminent light and we should. But at the same time, part and parcel of being steadfast in that hope of his returning is bearing up under the trials that he's going to appoint you to, to refine and purify your faith. Look at our text back in uh, verse 4 there in James 1. He says, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be what? Perfect and complete. Note, lacking in nothing and so James is saying here we need to keep uh, keep bearing up under any trial that God allows in our life because God is using it to perfect us and complete us and make sure that we lack nothing and from the text here we say endurance you see is not an end in of itself and so James is not saying that the end goal is the stoic grinding of the teeth, as if there's, no, if there's some sort of spiritual value in that. No, he's not saying that at all. James says that bearing up under the trial allows God to complete his perfect result. And you say, well, what's that perfect result? Well, it is your perfection. It is your completeness so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You say you desire to be like Jesus? Well, true believers do have that desire to be like their master and their Lord. And James says it is inevitable then that God will fit you for heaven. You will find yourself in God's refining fire, the crucible of trials and suffering. It always hurts, and it may drag on for months and months, even years, and in some cases it may even end up in death. And we all know that under a painful trial, we've all been there at some point or another, or there's one just around the corner waiting for us. We know that powerful emotions churn inside us day and night. Just go and read Job's struggle. Lost his entire family, lost his health. He was sitting on the pit, just scraping his boils. Like Job, doubts assail us. Even demonic deceptions about God's goodness will assail you. Fears will flood your mind. 
And you may even wish like Job that the day you were born was uncreated. Yet in the end, the believer prays and he clings to what he knows from God's word. What he knows, it's to do with knowledge about God's promises and his words. Circumstances do not define you. Circumstances do not define the sufferer who is a Christian. He knows that his refiner's his refiner is with him. Job knows that. And he remains with him throughout the most painful and unexpected of trials. And there's no mistake that Job's massive trial then is recorded in Scripture for us to read. It's probably the earliest book in the Old Testament. And through it all, Job could say, my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. Malachi understood this about God's people and he says in Malachi as well about God and he says this with absolute certainty. He says that he will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver. This is what God will do. He will purify the sons of Levi. He will refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Offerings in righteousness. Perhaps James's words in verse 2 seemed a little bit insensitive to you at first. But as a Christian, I hope you can see things perhaps from God's perspective then, from James' perspective, that a settled joy in the heart is possible in the knowledge that the ultimate reality of the painful and long trial that you are undergoing is passing through the hands of of a loving God who is fitting you for heaven. Through this process, your loving Father is making you like Christ. He is skimming off the dross. He is fitting you for an eternity with Christ in heaven. Clearly then, from James, we see that it is not the pain in the trial that causes our joy. God is not asking us to put on false airs and graces through the trial when we lose our job. He's not asking us to cheer on when a loved one gets cancer or a child is born with some incurable birth defect. No, he's telling us to rejoice in what we know because he knows that through the trials, God is producing in us something that money could never buy, that a life of ease will never produce. And that is a precious quality of Christ exalting wholeness and maturity. And so we often pray and we sing the songs. We desire that God would increase our faith and make us like Christ. But we want that process to be our way and certainly not through a painful trial. But that's uninformed hope. It is an omniscient, loving God who determines the ends as well as the means. Trials in the hands of a loving God have a beautiful end for the believer and are for the glory of God. Verse 4 again, it says there, So that we may be, we may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you want to be like your master, the Lord Jesus Christ, lacking in nothing? Oh, I can't wait for that day. Can you? Well, that's what he says here. This means that God will produce in us a, a Christ-likeness, a wholeness, and a completeness which lacks none of the moral and spiritual realities needed for heaven, where we are headed if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this passage also makes us realize that the dross of our sin and the dross of our selfishness is so alloyed and tightly bound with our flesh principle that remains in us that we have to trust that a loving God knows the best crucible and the right heat to remove it and sanctify us and refine us in our faith. And he will refine us into that glittering 24 carat maturity that reflects the character of Christ. On July the 30th, I've told this story back in 1967. Age 18, she was an excellent swimmer, very familiar with the sea, and she dived off a boat into the Chesapeake Bay. And she misjudged the shallowness of the water. And most of you probably know I'm talking about Johnny Erickson Tarder. She suffered a fracture between the fourth and fifth cervical levels of her spine and became a quadriplegic. 
She is now 74 years old. She spent 56 years in a wheelchair. <laughs> and she writes this. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. She says the apostle Peter too writes to her Christian friends being flogged and beaten. She, and he says this, in all this you had greatly rejoiced. They're being flogged. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. And she says rejoice when you're being thrown to the lions. That kind of nonchalance about gut-wrenching suffering used to drive me crazy, she says. Stuck in a wheelchair and staring out the window at the fields of our farm. I wondered, Lord, how in the world can you consider my troubles light and momentary? I will never walk or run again. I've got a leaky leg bag. I smell like urine. My back aches. I'm trapped in front of this window. And then years later, she says, the light dawned on her. The Spirit-inspired writers of the Bible simply had a different perspective. They had an end-time view. Perspective changes everything in the trial. What seemed so important at the time has no significance at all, she goes on and says. She says, I'm not saying that my paralysis is light and in and of itself it only becomes light in contrast to the far greater weight on the other side of the scale. And although I wouldn't call, normally call the decades I've had in a wheelchair momentary, it is when you realize that you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That's James 4. Nothing more radically altered the way I looked at my suffering than leapfrogging to this end of time vantage point. When God sent a broken neck my way, he blew out the lamps in my life that lit up the here and the now. And made it so captivating, that made that so captivating. The dark despair of a total and permanent paralysis that followed wasn't much fun, but it sure made heaven come alive. And one day, when our bridegroom comes back, probably when I'm right in the middle of lying down in my office sofa for the umpteenth time, God is going to throw open heaven's shutters. There is not a doubt in my mind that I will be fantastically more excited and ready for it than if I was on my feet. In the meantime, suffering hurries my heart homeward. Does suffering hurry your heart homeward? That's a divine perspective on God's purpose, is it not? Secondly, a divine perspective on prayer, verse 5. This is another perspective you must have. In verse 5, I'll read it to you. It says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If God is fitting us for heaven, then trials are inevitable. But James knows our weak frame and the reality of painful and long trials. The knowledge that God is perfecting us ought to give us that contented joy. But James further exhorts suffering believers to pray for wisdom. Think about how much time and money you spend on cultivating your education, your health, your strength in the gym or exercise. Ecclesiastes 9.16 says that wisdom is better than strength. Ecclesiastes 9.18 says that wisdom is even better than weapons of war. When we fall short of wisdom during a trial, all kinds of fears and doubts invade our minds. And even sinful thinking and sinful living and bad choices can, can be the result. And here in verse 5, James says we are not simply to ask anyone, but he says that we are to go to the source, the source of this unique wisdom, and that is we are to ask God. And the idea in this verb is that we are to make a practice of praying through the trial. Wisdom is necessary then to complete and perfect you spiritually and make you like Christ through a trial. And James in these verses, he doesn't give us a, a direct explanation of what this wisdom is. But in chapter 3, if you turn there quickly to verses, in verses 15 and 17, James contrasts this wisdom that he's talking about with earthly wisdom. 
In verse 15, he says, This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly and natural and demonic. For where there is jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. That's earthly wisdom. But he says this, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And so for James then, when he talks about wisdom, he's talking about the fact that it's divine, it comes from God, and it is practical. It issues in fruit. It brings forth fruit. You see the fruit there in verse 17. But the fruit of human wisdom is earthly, uh, even demonic. It produces disorder and chaos and unruliness and every evil thing. But spiritual wisdom sourced in God results in purity, peace, gentleness, reasonableness, mercy, good fruits, and no hypocrisy. And this is in the middle of a trial. Wisdom is not simply academic or intellectual knowledge about an illness or being able to recite a few memorized Bible verses, though those those might be helpful things. The central point here is that the sufferer needs wisdom from God. As one writer said, wisdom is the endowment of heart and mind which is needed for the right conduct of life through a trial. And so the believer under painful trial then is exhorted by James to ask God for a mindset then that discerns God's will and correct perspective on his and her suffering. This perspective then, this wisdom then leads to skillful and godly living, enduring the trial in all goodness and fortitude. Look at verse 5 again. Notice how God gives wisdom to those who ask. James says, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. And so what happens when we encounter painful trials? Often we will start with prayer and then the prayer becomes less and less. And from an ongoing divine perspective, James is encouraging the suffering Christian to be confident in prayer, to continue in prayer, to ask for wisdom. And you can approach God for wisdom because firstly, it says there that God is a giving God. God characteristically gives to his children he has, a, he has a beneficent character, and out of love, he loves to give. And then verse 5, secondly, it says that God gives indiscriminately. In other words, God gives to all. That means all kinds of believers without reservation, all who ask. And then thirdly, to encourage prayer, James says that God will also give generously. And the idea is that full of liberality, a cup that is overflowing. That's how God gives. And finally, you see that God gives without reproach. And that means that God is not kind, some kind of austere, fault-finding God. And that He gives, He humiliates those who He gives to, or He belittles them, or He reviles them, or He shames them if they ask Him. Not at all. One writer says that prayer substitutes man's weakness with God's strength, man's ignorance with God's wisdom, man's emptiness with God's fullness, man's poverty with God's wealth, and man's impotence with God's omnipotence. And knowing this, would you not want to unreservedly then approach God in your pain? The faithful Christian undergoing painful trials then is a praying believer. And James is not saying that the believer never asks others to pray for him. In fact, if you turn uh, over to chapter 5 quickly, verses 14 to 16, you can see there that in verse 14 of chapter 5, James says, is anyone among you sick? Well, then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So what you see in your Bible here, in one of the earliest letters in the New Testament, even in chapter 5, is the importance of a local church. James does not, does not see healing vested in some kind of itinerant person who's running around with magical power. James sees this corporate aspect of suffering and commitment to the membership of a local body, and it makes sense then for elders to know who they're accountable for and who they ought to pray for. 
You are part of a spiritual body, the body of Christ. You are not an island stoically suffering on your own. Commit to the church. Speak to the elders and leaders of the church. Ask for prayer. Ask for prayer in your small group or the men's group or the ladies Bible study. Pray for one another, James says. God is still a healing God. If it's his will to heal, he will heal. And so James encourages us then to have the right perspective on suffering and prayer. And it's an essential exercise then as we pray to ask God for wisdom during the trial. And God's revealed moral will is for believers to know him then and to live wisely through the trial that he puts us through. Spurgeon said this about prayer. He said the very invitation to us to pray implies that there are blessings waiting for us at the mercy seat. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. And so we see God's a divine perspective then on the purpose of God in suffering in verses 2 to 4. We see a divine perspective on prayer in the middle of trials in verse 5. And now God gives us a divine perspective on doubt in verse 6. James does offer a qualification concerning the prayer for wisdom here. It must be offered in faith with no doubting. Look at verse 6. But he, that is the sufferer, must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And so James here commands his listeners to ask God for wisdom in verse 5. But here in verse 6, he exhorts them to ensure that they have the right heart attitude in prayer. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 11.6, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, some of you face very difficult circumstances and trials. And when that happens, we start in the beginning usually praying. But as the trial becomes harder and harder and longer and longer, we become prayerless. We, also, we, we almost become faithless. We allow our minds to fill up with doubts about the promises and the character of God. And James knows this. And he clearly states that believers must ask in faith without doubting. And this doesn't refer to initial faith at salvation, but the idea of continuing to trust in God and his character and his goodness and his generosity throughout the trial. And so James's concern here is that his people don't develop a duplicitous frame of mind or heart that is divided. The disciples were told by Jesus when they prayed that if they would never doubt but would have faith, a mountain could be taken up and cast into the sea. And the people of God, Israel, is a prime case really as we look at the history of Israel, the history of Israel for their doubting. Many times Moses warned Israel about doubting God's character and his promises and disobeying him. In one place, Moses says this in Deuteronomy, For the people of Israel, the result of disobedience to the law of God was that your life shall hang in doubt before you. Deuteronomy 28, 66. The idea is that doubt leads to disobedience and a trembling heart and despair in their souls so that their entire lives and in their minds hang in the balance before them. But then there are examples in Scripture for us to imitate as well. Scripture shows us that Abraham, who was not perfect uh, and, and, and fell repeatedly to the fear of man, uh, on occasion uh, he, he never doubted. He never doubted God's promises in his own soul. In fact, Paul in Romans 4, 20 to 21 says this about Abraham. Yet with respect to the promises of God, the promise of God, he, Abraham, did not waver, that's the same word as in James 1, 6, doubt, in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. And so James illustrates this point in verse 6 to make his point clearer. And here's a picture of a doubting Christian right here. He says he is like the surf. Look at that text, being churned about, tossed all over by the storm and the wind, going this way and then changing suddenly. And you can imagine blowing the other way and then changing again. And we certainly are reminded of Peter from this morning stepping out of the boat at Jesus' command and he steps out in faith. 
And then he allows fear to grip his soul. And he focuses on his circumstances. He doubts. And he takes his eyes off Christ. And he only sees the wind and the waves. In Matthew 14, we heard that this morning. And Jesus diagnosed the root of his doubting as little faith. Little faith. And what a beautiful picture that Jesus still reaches out and grips him tightly so that Peter does not sink below the waves. And then James warns believers here in verses 7 and 8 in our text, For that man ought not to expect they to receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Another way to translate John, James 1.8, double-mindedness, is a double-souled man. He's unstable in everything he pursues. And James is saying that if this is the picture, this wind-tossed surf, if that's an accurate picture of your faith in God's character and his promises, and you, you, you are praying to God and you expect God to respond to your, your prayer, James says rather in fact you should not expect anything from God. And so James is dealing with a sense of entitlement here. And if you think about it, we've left Johannesburg many times. I'm sure you have to fly to other countries. And we've flown to the United States and over the uh, eastern coast to India. In fact, the flight of the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea is one of the most turbulent flights you can take uh, at all in the world today. And the airplane is often, often buffeted, it's thrown to and fro. And, and I've been in that plane and it's just dropped. And it seems like a lifetime before it's going to start flying again. And it's... It's, it's kind of a terrifying thing. But what is amazing to see is how many people around you whose mouths when you took off were full of bad language and they start praying to God that God will keep them safe. But that doubt still exists. And this is what James is talking about, this presumption and entitlement. Uh, yes, it might be likely that in this airplane they're mostly unbelievers praying to their idol and I would hope that not believers. But if you as a believer ever pray and doubt God, then James would refer to such professing believers as double-minded. Double-minded. And that's an interesting term because only James actually uses this term in the New Testament. It means it, it relates to an internal heart issue. He's referring between this division within a believer that brings about inconsistency or a wavering attitude towards God, his character, and his word. And James says, you can see this person on the outside. How can we see him? Because it says, this person is unstable in all his ways. And this means the internal spiritual problem is made manifest in a characteristically unstable and disordered spiritual life. There's a lack of instability, a lack of self-discipline, a lack of self-control, a lack of trust in God. And as we think about this, perhaps some of you even sitting here tonight see this pattern of double-mindedness. You know Christ, you believe upon Christ, but in sickness and the hardships, the spiritual cracks start to appear in your life. Nothing in this text says don't seek medical help or anything like that. Go through hospitals, physicians. Uh, two books in our New Testament are written by a doctor. But the fundamental question here is, do you see the big picture? Do you recognize that a loving God uses the circumstance of your life, whatever trial you are in now, whatever hardship you are in, for your sanctification to conform you to the image of Christ and to fit you for an eternity in heaven. Grasp that picture and you will not be double-minded. Do you see that perhaps you need to bear up under the trial that you face and persevere in the faith? Do you see that there is no trial in the life of a Christian that is meaningless and purposeless? God is working tirelessly in his sovereign province through every trial that you face. He knows what you can bear. He is ensuring that you will be lacking nothing spiritually and he will see you safely across the Jordan River as we have sung in the past. And God may not take you out of the trial now. Sincerely praying for wisdom and not doubting gives you a perspective on your trial. And if you find yourself wavering, 
Pray for wisdom. Seek the counsel of godly men and women in your church, even as chapter 5 encourages us. And if the trial is extremely hard and painful and doubts creep into your mind, then James gives us the sure verdict to the doubt. Chapter 4, verse 8, what does he say there? He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so here, double-minded is the same word as in verse 8. And so do you like, look like this unstable person that James is referring to in chapter uh, 1, verse 8? Here's the solution. Right here, James gives it to his flock. Draw near to God. Stop sinning. Repent of doubt. Believe upon God's good character. Read and take his word and his promises into your heart. Cease from sinful thoughts and behaviors. Continue, continue to pray for wisdom. God is generous. He will give it. Like Abraham, be fully assured about the character and promises of God. And there is the antidote right there in the text. Picture a ship's anchor that's, very, that's set very deep in the ocean bed. And if you think of a very large ship with this anchor that's in the ground and the seabed, and it stops the ship from moving, that's exactly how the writer to Hebrews puts it. He says in Hebrews 6, verses 17 to 20, In the same way, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed uh, with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, listen, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Do you have that anchor of the soul during trials? No matter the circumstances, Psalm 119 verse 2 says, Those who pursue God with a whole heart will be blessed. Paul clearly shows us in Romans 8 that even though the, the creation groans under sin and judgment that is coming, in a Christian's life, every event, every joy, every, every joy, every trial, every sickness, every persecution passes through his hands first to ensure that it works to the good of that believer, essentially conforming him to the image of Christ uh, and fitting him for glory. Read Romans 8 verses 35 to 39 tonight. And so no matter how difficult the trials are, don't doubt God. Don't doubt his character. Don't doubt his promises in any way. Let that purifying hope in God reign supreme in your heart. Let it be an anchor for your soul. And don't forget who reached out and grabbed Peter's arm as he was sinking. Jesus Christ himself. And so we've seen a divine perspective on purpose in verses 2 of God's purpose, verses 2 and 4. A divine perspective on prayer a divine perspective on doubt and not doubting in verses 6 to 8. And interesting, as we come to this little section here, many people leave it out because they're not quite sure how this fits in in verses 9 to 11. And so verses 9 to 11 kind of throw us out here. So um, I want you to just look at that yourself and read that as I go through it. But sandwiched between endurance through trials in verses 2 and 4 and this final perseverance in verse 12, James highlights the necessity for believers then to look beyond their economic conditions and gain God's perspective even on their spiritual status, their social status. And so just to be, to be clear, as we look at these verses here, God does not condemn hard work and the wealth that comes from honest and legal business practices and clear innovation. And Scripture encourages property ownership and hard work. And Scripture condemns the sluggard and those who are lazy. And we see the testimony of the lives like Job and Abraham and David, very wealthy men. And even the rich man Joseph is mentioned in the New Testament and he selflessly provided Jesus his own burial tomb. So to thrust some kind of liberal socialist agenda on the book of James would be gross eisegesis and totally missing the point. 
And yet scripture does teach us that it is the idolatry of materialism that is a treacherous snare. Both poor people and rich people mentioned in verses 9 to 11 are subject to covet, are subject to idolized wealth or materialism. But based on Jesus' teaching, wrong motivations towards riches have an explicit danger. And so like Jesus, James emphasizes that here as well. Remember, James is writing in a turbulent time. Christians, many of them have been forced to uproot their houses, leave Jerusalem. Others have lost their jobs. In others, their family has come against them. They are being ostracized. They are being slandered by their families now that they follow Christ. And those who are in the new community of believers have even fallen ill and got sick. Their social economic situation has radically changed. For some, they were poor already and now they've become indigent. Other Jews were wealthy and their wealth was perhaps given them a temporary buffer through the trials uh, uh, in this difficult time. And so the poor and the rich are now both going through trials and persecution. And guess what? They are both lumped together in a new church community. And the tendency in the new community is towards pride and comparison. Later, you'll see that James condemns the evils of favoritism and partiality. And so James's main concern here is that all these believers exercise genuine faith and gain a perspective on their spiritual identity from God's perspective. They need to grasp how God views their status in life, not how the world does it. In verse 9 then, James begins with a lowly brother. You see that there. The term lowly is often paired with the orphan or the widow, and it refers to a low status of the person. It's directly linked to their economic situation. And James is calling you to have a divine perspective. If this is you on your social status. James says this brother should glory in his high position. You say, James, what high position? This is the way God sees this lowly brother, God's perspective. In the world's eyes, he's poor, he's low status, and what he believes uh, in terms of a crucified Messiah is of little consequence to the world. They couldn't care less because he's a poor man. But in the eyes of God, his status has great value, says James. This person occupies a high position. This lowly believer more clearly sees his worth in Christ and is obviously totally dependent on God for day-to-day -day provision, faith, and trust. Clearly then, in the view of God, worldly economic or social status and wisdom, wisdom of God, are not the same thing. Paul picks this up in 1 Corinthians 7.22 and he says, Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let that trouble you. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. And so then James, then in contrast, in verses 10 and 11, yeah, he focuses on the wealthy brother. He is also undergoing the same circumstances, the same trial as the poor brother. And James says the divine perspective on them is that they are in fact in a low position or a humiliated position. They ought to see their position from God's perspective and be very wary, and here's the point, of trusting in their wealth, which the world takes as a high position. The rich believer, unlike the poor Christian, uh, must work hard to hold lightly to the things of the world and to elevate foolishness, which is a Messiah crucified on the cross. And to drive this point home, unlike the poor brother, James has a warning for the rich brother under trial here. And this illustration is of the flowering grass. Look at verses 10 and 11 there. And so the rich man's pursuits are pictured as flowering grass with this beautiful flower. The trials of life are the sun and the scorching wind and scorched by the heat and torn by the wind. The beautiful flower falls off and its beauty is destroyed and the grass is no longer. Wealth fades away. The dangers and deceitfulness of wealth and money was often highlighted through Jesus' and the apostles' teaching. Those whose master is mammon are in a dangerous place to pay lip service to God and trust in their wealth. And this danger, is captured in, uh, this danger of wealth is captured in Proverbs 18.11, where it says, The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine 
it to be an unscalable wall. And Psalm 46 verses 16 and 17 says this, Do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. And so what does James want here? James wants both the poor man and the rich man. These are believers thrust together in this new Jewish Christian community to exercise faith and each to glory in God. God's perspective on their status before him. And so under trials and hardship, prayer and wisdom from above opens both of their understanding to the character of God, the glories of heaven, and how to live out faithful lives backed up by good deeds. And this is what James' main concern then is in writing this letter. And so we've seen four divine perspectives here on suffering so that you will end your Christian life well. And you're going to see James conclude now. Those four perspectives are on God's purpose in trials, God's perspective on prayer, God's perspective on doubting in prayer, and then, of course, God's perspective on your social status. And now James ends with the end or the goal in verse 12. And let's read this text, and here's the conclusion. It's the divine perspective on the end, if you like. Verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And so believers, poor and rich alike under difficult trials, need wisdom to see their, their spiritual identity from God's perspective. And otherwise, you can be double-minded and doubt God. And so here James concludes the section by taking his listeners back right to his opening verses, verses 2 to 4, and he reiterates the fact that believers are indeed blessed under troubled circumstances. And as you and I grasp these divine perspectives, James gives us another great word of encouragement here to continue to persevere under trial. Look what it is here. For what also makes this massive difference is your end or your goal. In all this testing, God promises to pers persevering believers who love him this incredible crown of life. James' listeners would have no problem visualizing that crown, that Stephanus, that unique singular wreath, often made from precious metal like gold. It resembled leaves on a vine. There was only one. There's not one for second or third place. It was laid on the head of a champion and esteemed athletic games, or even refers to the crown worn by a dignitary of high status. In fact, divine beings in Revelation wear a Stephanus of gold. And this crown is related to the occasions of gladness. There's always occasions of gladness and rejoicing when they award this crown as well. And here, it is awarded in the presence of God and divine beings. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 4, that the chief says it is the chief shepherd's award to his faithful under shepherds. And Paul poured out through many of his trials, says in his last letter in 2 Timothy that he's finished the race and he's looking forward to the crown of righteousness that God, the righteous judge, will award. And so what attracts this divine prestigious award is your perseverance under trial. Do you see that there? It is awarded by the highest being in the universe, the creator God himself, and it is according to his sure promise. And notice in verse 12, it is to those who love God. Many believers think about the problem of pain, but few of us pause to think about the problem of happiness. Why should a holy God give restful days, a happy home, healthy children to sinners like us. How I should love him for his blessings. And likewise, it is, true that, it is true that hardships cause us to draw near to him. And he is to ask us, do you still love me in the end? A young husband once said after his wife finally and tragically died from a terrible lingering cancer, it must be that the Lord still has something for me to do. Else why has he left me here? And someone replied, He has not left you to do anything except love him still. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for these divine perspectives on suffering. 
And I pray for each believer here tonight that they would see your purpose through the trial or struggle they may be facing. That they would pray for wisdom. That they would pray for wisdom without doubting. And that, Father, no matter their social status, that they would realize it's not dependent on whether they're poor or rich to gain a divine perspective on their suffering. But, Father, that they would gain your perspective. And in the end, Lord, we just thank you for this crown that you will award us one day for persevering and enduring and bearing up under trial simply because of your promise. And so we thank you for that. And I pray for each one here tonight that they would be encouraged then as we face uncertain days in the days ahead. I also would pray, Lord, if there's any person here tonight who does not know you and realizes that their doubting and wavering mind is possibly linked to the fact that they have not committed their life to you. They have not received and believed upon Lord Je the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may you make that clear to them tonight. And may they receive you and believe upon you. May they repent of their sinfulness and put their faith and trust in you. And so we commit this to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.